my God, he just admitted he killed my daughter. He said that he went out one night and he went to some girl's trailer and went in with the intention of kidnapping her. It's not that I don't feel emotion, but I keep a very tight frame on it. I used to go to high school with him. He was creepy to me. There was death, the high priest deaths. Killed my what? goddamn sister. <laughs> From the moment Lee was born, Max Porter was very protective of his little sister. The two remained as thick as thieves all throughout high school. And when Max went off to college to major in massage therapy, Lee followed him as soon as she could, even going into the same major. Unfortunately, the siblings couldn't be joined at the hip forever. And when Max moved to California after college, Lee began to struggle. She fell behind in school and eventually dropped out. At 19, she began a relationship with a 38-year-old man named Jesse. According to interviews with Jesse, it was while dating him that Lee found herself immersed in a world full of parties, drama, and heroin. This went on for months, with Lee's friends and family noticing her rapid decline into addiction and depression. In May of 2014, Lee made a concerning post on Facebook. Some nights, I can't sleep. I end up staying up all night thinking of all the things in my life I f***ed up. You'd think after trying really hard to get back up on my feet and actually doing it, I'd be proud of myself, but nope. I simply can't get out of this state of depression. I would love it if someone would talk to me right now, with an open mind and heart. Lee's DMs were soon filled to the brim with people reaching out to help her. One of the many friends and family members who reached out was a man named Christopher Wade. The two had known each other in high school, but hadn't been incredibly close. Regardless, Chris reached out and told Lee that if she ever needed someone to talk to, he was always there. Seeing him as someone who cared about her well-being, she began confiding in him about the struggles she'd been going through. Jesse was planning on moving away in order to get clean, meaning Lee was about to be homeless. She also told him about her struggles with addiction. Despite the bad choices she'd made, Lee wanted nothing more than to get her life on track, and she was determined to get sober. Eager to help his friend, Chris offered to be her accountability partner on her journey to sobriety, and he even offered to help her move into a friend's house on June 3rd. With some hope for the future, Lee was looking forward to June 3rd and getting her life on track. However, the date came and went, and those closest to Lee realized that no one had heard from her in over 24 hours. While it might be normal to go days without hearing from a friend or relative, Lee always kept in contact with people, and she would update her Facebook page multiple times a day. Silence from her could only mean one thing. Something was terribly wrong. The last thing Renee, Lee's mother, had heard from Lee was that she was planning on going to Chris's apartment on the 3rd. Renee called Chris to ask if Lee was with him, and he told her that Lee had left his apartment on the 3rd and had gotten into a mysterious truck. Not thinking much of it at the time, Chris informed Renee that he hadn't heard from Lee since she left his apartment, and he was shocked to learn that no one else had either. With no sign of Lee anywhere, Renee got the police involved and Facebook groups were quickly organized to help find any information regarding Lee's location. After a week with no sign of her anywhere, the police began interviewing those closest to Lee to see if they could shed some light on what may have happened to her. Eager to find her, Chris spoke to police in the hopes that maybe he could help them track down the mysterious truck he had seen Lee get into. The following mostly never-before-seen footage has been analyzed by a qualified team including a licensed attorney, a licensed clinical psychologist, and a licensed professional counselor. So I understand that Lee actually came and spent some time with you. Yes. And you kind of repeated that story at nauseum, so yeah. I'm not going to go through yeah. a lot of the details as to that because I've read the reports. And yeah. You went through pretty much in detail with Detective Lopez this morning about how, you know, she started messaging you back and forth on Facebook in the last couple yeah. of weeks. and. Stop me if I'm wrong and correct me if I'm wrong, but let me just summarize this a little bit. She had been messaging you, telling you that her relationship was going bad, asked you about maybe having a place to stay. Um, you agreed to let her do that. Yeah. Is that correct? Yes. Why would she ask you a um, place to stay? She didn't ask me. I offered it to her. Okay. 
Um, and as far as it wasn't that it was going bad, that she, it was that she had already broken up with her boyfriend. Um, I asked her if she needed a place to stay or if she needed money or anything like that. She never asked me for money, but she did initially take me up on uh, having a place to crash for a while until she got back on her feet. As soon as detectives begin questioning Chris on his relationship with Lee, his hand comes up to his face. This could be a sign of discomfort and self-soothing, which detectives will likely take note of. However, being in an interrogation in front of police would make anyone uncomfortable. Tell me, Chris, why would you be so generous and offer to let your place be used by a young drug user? Um, I guess the best answer to that would be is because she's a friend. And I'm extremely loyal to my friends if any of them, even the ones I haven't spoken to in years, were to ask me for it, I'd give them the shirt off my back. Chris starts out his response by saying, I guess the best answer would be. This seems to imply that he's not just answering, but instead, he's thinking about the best way to answer and the way that would be the most acceptable to the detectives. The truth would likely be a bit of niceness mixed with a bit of self-serving motivation. While this is a completely standard motivation for helping someone, Chris is clearly worried that this might make him look suspicious. His words here are likely a slip-up, as they show he's more interested in giving the best answer rather than the truth. I was, I asked her, you know, where am I meeting you so we can go and get the, uh, so we can go and get your stuff and get you moved in. I tried asking her several times on that, but she never really, uh, reply to that she would always change the subject would she ever get mad at you and act like you were crying no not to my, not to my knowledge so during this most recent time when she was spending time with you was she ever angry you know she was very depressed though then around one o'clock we went over to the boston market off of the uh, 92nd chair and during this time you were with her did she talk about a drug problem at all um you know, I, I asked her how she was doing, and she said she was doing good, and then uh, she hadn't had any temptations or had been using again. Did she seem like she had been high, that she was high at that time? Not really. It seemed, now that I think about it, that she was more coming down off of it. Chris states that he believed Lee might have been coming down off of a high. The short-term effects of coming down would be an elevated heart rate, elevated breathing rate, and an increased blood pressure rate, making the individual seem almost panicky. From how we've heard Chris describe Lee that day, she seemed to be calm and quiet to the point of appearing depressed. Based on this description, it seems unlikely that she was actually coming down off a high. When you said you, that she was depressed, what did you mean by that? Uh, she had told me she was depressed. She told you she was. Yes. She 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 texted. I am depressed. She texted me on Tuesday morning and said, I'm feeling kind of depressed. Can we hang out? Mm, okay. And so I said, okay. And I'm, I was making sure that I was keeping, trying to keep her as uh, optimistic as possible. How are we doing? Um, I'm just... I treated her out to lunch, I was being as courteous as possible to her, you know, asking her, you hungry, you want something to, something to eat, some snacks, uh, something to drink, when we got back. And she seemed to be somewhat receptive to that, but throughout the whole time, the smiles never went to her eyes. And, well... Normal smiling will cause the eyes to start to crinkle a little bit, to squint. But when she was smiling, it was just with her mouth. There wasn't any eye movement. So what does that tell you? That, um, that tells me that she was... Um, that she was kind of... That she was telling the truth when she was depressed. But now that I think about it, with her coming down, it just might have been that she didn't like lying to me. Chris is a student of criminal justice at Everest College, 
so this observation may be something he picked up in a class on nonverbal communication and behavioral analysis, though it also indicates that he was watching her very closely. So you guys were together then that afternoon after you've eaten at the restaurant? Yeah. You're back at your place playing video games? Yes. How long did that go on for, you think? I uh, um, for maybe uh, two hours or something. A couple hours. Yeah. Does she bring up the depression issue anymore? No, she doesn't, but I, I still keep an eye on her. So you, you characterize her behavior then that afternoon as being depressed? Is that what you're yes. saying? As depressed, but not self-destructive. By stating that Lee seemed depressed, Chris appears to be leaving open the option that Lee might have taken her own life. I was, uh, we were just getting ready to get back from the video game, then she leaned in and kissed me. I was letting her go as far as she wanted. Then when it led to the bedroom, we kind of flip-flopped between uh, who had the wheel, so to speak. Well, before you actually went into the bedroom, was there some discussion about her? Um, well, I, when she started taking off her sweater, I broke it off and I asked, are you sure about this? Is this, uh, I'm, I'm not asking you to do this. I made it very clear that I was not wanting to impose that on her or any sort of, um, Implication towards that. Did you end up using a condom? No, I did not. So she didn't ask you to, and you didn't have one of you? I offered to, but she said no. Was there ever any concern on your part that maybe she'd been pretty active? And that possibly you were putting yourself at risk for an STD? Um, I mean, that's always a possibility with anyone you meet, but but that didn't really occur to me until after. Really? I mean, yeah. an Android user who's doing dope and no place to live and... Well, it seemed to me from my discussions, and I know I say, I'm saying that a lot, but it looked to me from the way she was wording things and the way she was talking that she hadn't really gone that far to get drugs. And I got sort of a confirmation from this from her boyfriend who admitted to using with her for a while but then started cleaning himself up that she didn't really like the idea of paying for something. Although the detectives don't know it yet, this statement from Chris would later play a vital part in their investigation. Afterwards, she just asked, you know, I'm tired, can I just pass out for a while? And then about, uh, I don't know, an hour, hour and a half back. As he speaks, Chris has been engaging in a lot of face-touching and stroking behaviors. This kind of continuous movement can indicate doubt or uncertainty. The person might be unsure about a particular idea, question, or situation and the repetitive gesture could be a self-soothing or comforting behavior used to manage stress or discomfort. Occasional chin stroking wouldn't necessarily be suspect, but Chris has constantly had his hand to his face throughout the interview. My roommate came back home, and I let him know that, yeah, we, <laughs> I had a guest over and that we were uh, not decent. <laughs> Chris appeared to cover his mouth here. This could be an indication that some part of this statement is either a half-truth or a lie, as sometimes people try to literally cover their lie as it comes out of their mouth. What did she say inside the bedroom then? Um, well, for the most part, she was asleep in my bed. Then afterwards, I was out there, to, I was out in the living room, we were talking, uh, you know, we were talking, that's my roommate's name. Then she said something that, caused a uh, light bulb and that uh, uh, and I started thinking and she had that back with her that she didn't let leave her side. If she went out to get something from her car, she would bring that with her. She what kind of bag are you talking about? It was a purple bag, I think it was a crown royal bag. She was talking about one of those little velvet bags that they carry around for Yeah. Statues, that type of thing. Yeah. And and in fact, you later looked in that bag. 
Yes. Afterwards, I saw her drug paraphernalia. I only went through the crown a while back. I think. So you found out while she's sleeping. Yeah. You woke her up. Yeah, I woke her up very gently. I uh, I apologized for, to her because I looked into the bag. What was her response to you violating her privacy? After I explained myself to her, I think she was annoyed that I had done it without her permission, but I think she understood where I was coming from because. Um, as I told her, I was worried about her. So I just wanted to make sure that she was okay. Notice the change in pitch and rushed way he says, okay. Make sure that she was okay. He's not being very forceful with the word, as if he knows she wasn't okay. As well, deceptive people often engage in what is known as emphasis. Emphasis could include many behaviors, with one such behavior being repetition, where the deceptive individual repeats a key point or phrase that supports what they want to instill in the listener's mind. In this case, Chris is repeatedly mentioning how he's a nice guy and was very gentle to Lee, even when he was waking her up and confronting her about her potential drug use. I woke her up very gently. I... It's possible that there was a time when Chris was not so proper and gentlemanly with Lee so he may want to emphasize this supposed gentlemanly side of himself in order to hide his darker side. After, after I woke her up, I, um, she still seemed kind of depressed, but not as much. So, so that you woke her up to confront her about yes. the drug Yes, and she still seemed kind of depressed, so I did what I don't normally do. I, if someone asks me to do a tarot reading for them, I... Will do a tarot reading for them, but other than that, there's not very many people that I will ask if they would like me to do a tarot reading for them. After I laid out the cards, the first thing that popped out to me were that there were three of the major arcana. Those indicate something significant. Show me what you did. Okay. Well, I mean, it's better for you to show yeah. and explain it because I'm completely right. lost. Notes about some of Chris's past tarot readings would eventually make their way into the hands of law enforcement. His entries clearly express just how seriously he took his interpretations of the meanings behind the cards. One note in particular was especially ominous. It read as follows. The devil reversed. This is a curious card to reveal in this position. The devil represents the base nature of man, the primordial chaos as opposed to the reasonable order. The devil is known as the sin card, representing murder, lies, deceit, trickery, and other such things. It is unclear which meaning is right. Based on the position and the reversal, it could mean that I must stick to the straight and narrow. Transversely, it could mean that, in order to get the results I desire, I must do something morally wrong. In time, it seems the meaning behind the card became all too clear for Chris. Well, the cards I used are number two of them. Well, I'm about 95% sure on what the other three were. There was death, the high priestess, the three of cups, ace of wands, and judgment. Overall, I told her that this... It was, very it was one of the more optimistic readings that I had ever done. A lot of these cards, I literally almost all of these cards, death accepted, are very positive cards. They don't have any sort of, uh, well, not necessarily negative meaning, but the negative meanings that they do have are not um, as significant as her, as she would come to physical harm. Or anything like that. So you told her it was an optimistic reading. Yeah. So I told her that based off of you know what the cards were saying, as well as what was, as well as what she had told me that this, though it may not seem like it at a good time, is actually going to be very good for her. Following this statement, Chris can be seen rubbing his face, which is another sign of his possible anxiety and lack of confidence. Detectives then pivot and begin asking Chris for more information regarding the mysterious truck that supposedly picked Lee up that day. So how would somebody who contacted her and left either a message or 
her phone notified her, gave her a notification. How would they even know where she was at? Honestly, I thought that that was her ride. I didn't know if she had a car or not, because um, she said she needed my car to help with the storage for moving. So I thought that, that meant she didn't have a car and that she had gotten a ride up here from someone else. It wasn't until Friday afternoon that when her brother Max called me that I even realized she even had a car. This is actually a lie. Lee's car was found abandoned at Chris's apartment complex. Not only does this show that Chris is being dishonest, but it also calls into question why Lee would get into a mysterious truck if her vehicle was with her. Had she been planning on coming back? Well, earlier you said that when she, would, she would keep that bag with her at all times. So she, she went out of her car. Oh. Here, Chris is caught in another of many lies. When confronted over his conflicting statements regarding Lee's car, Chris stops talking and can be heard taking many deep breaths. When individuals are anxious, the body needs more oxygen. So people will use various methods to get that oxygen, such as breathing deep or sniffing. Have you ever traveled with her anywhere after that? No. Once she got in that truck and left your parking lot, you and I have seen her. I have seen her. Where did you go with her? The only place I went with her besides within my apartment was to Boston Market, and I showed the uh, I showed the officers when they arrived the receipt for the Boston Market. You didn't go anywhere else? Then? Nowhere else. Have you traveled yourself? towards the DIA, uh, out towards the airport at all in the last couple of days? No. Since she's left, you've not gone out that direction? No, not at all. There's schools up around Grant, Grant, and 97 Grant. Yes. Have you gone east of there? No, not really. I, mean, I don't really get out all that much. Um, for the most part, I mean, I might go out uh, maybe once in a blue moon and have a drink at the bar. But other than that, I stay at home, uh, watch movies, or work on my book, or what, or what have you. So who would be to get a printout from your phone's provider? Who's your phone provider? Trackphone. I know, Trackphone. Is that the actual company that yes. provides the service? Yes. And Trackphone was able to give us the coordinates for every time your phone pinged somewhere. Yeah. Which they can do, I don't know if you know what yeah, that but means, but... When your phone is activated either by receiving a call, sending a text, whatever, receiving yeah. a text, it bounces off of a cell tower. Yeah. I understand. So that. if we traced your phone, what would it tell us? Notice how this is the moment that Chris decides to tidy up the cards, which is likely a grooming behavior. This suggests that Chris is feeling anxious about the information his phone may reveal about his location. Individuals may engage in grooming behaviors in order to expel nervous energy. This may take the form of grooming themselves, such as adjusting the collar of their shirt or smoothing out imaginary wrinkles from their clothes. It may also involve grooming their immediate surroundings, such as wiping dust off the table, moving a water glass, or in Chris's case, stacking up his tarot cards. When Chris is asked about what his phone data will show, you can see him covering his mouth, which can be a sign of deception, as individuals may do this as a way of literally covering a lie. Now that detectives know the supposed story of what happened to Lee on June 3rd, it's time for them to ask Chris some hard-hitting questions. Unbeknownst to him, they've been doing their research on him over the past week, and they've discovered some very disturbing information straight from Vicki Wade, Chris's own mother. Can you, can you fill me up in a little bit of Christopher's history growing up? Yeah, he went into the Army. How did he do it? He did some deployment time? He did some deployment time. He started having nightmares in deployment, and they sent him back. Okay. Did he get discharged? Yes. And now, what was what was that? Was that a medical discharge? or? It was a medical, yeah. For psychiatric reasons? Yes. Okay. And he said he didn't get a lot of sleep. They didn't have the barracks set up to where the night crew could sleep. 
I don't know if that contributed to the hallucinations. I'm not sure exactly what he was hallucinating. What would make um, he had hallucinations? That's what he told me. He did? Yeah. What? That's what Chris told me. When was that? When he, um, when he was in the Army after he got back. What, what kind of hallucinations? It's possible that the stress from the deployment triggered Chris to experience psychosis. It's also a possibility that he faked symptoms to get out of the military. But typically, military doctors are able to assess for malingering, which is when someone exaggerates or fakes illness. Growing up, his dad was into... And Chris found it online at a very young age. Chris was pretty messed up with it in high school. Okay. He stashed pictures of every sort. Um, what was he looking at? Well, I call it pretty hardcore. It was... Are you talking about, like, bondage stuff, or is it just strictly... No, not really bondage, just ugly stuff. I, I heard things from... Uh, the principal called me one day and said he had... Uh, Touched a girl inappropriate at school. How old was he then? That yeah, was the sophomore junior year. When's the last when's the last time you talked to me, said? Um the last time we talked was a week ago. Yeah. He was home not this past weekend, but the weekend before. And he's got a new girlfriend and we were talking about that and and uh, some of the concerns that I had in, in this situation. What did you say? Um, well, she, she told him that she wanted to talk to me. Um, she's pregnant, not by Chris, but by another man. And um, Chris was... The feeling I got is Chris was trying to rescue her from some of bad boyfriends that she's had. Trying to rescue vulnerable women seems to be a pattern with Chris. Not only did he do this with his pregnant girlfriend, but he also tried to do something similar with Lee, offering her a place to stay and some money as soon as he learned she was down on her luck and recovering from an addiction. I asked her if she needed a place to stay or if she needed money or anything like that. This grandiose complex may make Chris feel like the savior or hero who is protecting all of these women. I mean, I... I don't. I really appreciate you opening up to me and calling me. It's that. really hard because I don't want him to get in trouble for for the past stuff. Right. Armed with this disturbing information, it's time for detectives to confront Chris. Well, the family's pretty concerned about this whole topic. Yeah. And and you know they're they're being accusatory towards us. Yeah. Directed at you, and they're upset at you about this whole thing. They think you took advantage of her. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And on top of that, they actually think that you did something to her. Honestly, yeah. I don't know where that's coming from from them. I mean, yeah, I don't really know the mother all that well, but... Well, let me tell you one place it's coming from. Okay. It's coming from family, friends, and specifically related to your mother. Mm -hmm. Telling people things about fantasies that you had in high school. Uh huh. Oh, there wasn't anything like that concerning we. And well, how about just fantasies that maybe you might have shared with either your mother or other family members or people about what some of the fantasies might have been in high school? Honestly, my fantasy life is private. I keep that completely separate from my uh, from my normal life and. Well, most people do, but yeah. this was enough that it was actually, it's out there. We have people telling us now that you had fantasies in high school of wanting to kill women and, and bury them in the woods. He said that he went out one night, and we didn't know it, and he went to some girl's trailer and went in with the intention of kidnapping her and taking her out in the woods. The dog started barking or something, and, and so he got scared and left. Did he say what his plan was to do when he kidnapped that girl? He was going to take her out in the woods for, well, he and kill her. From how she describes it, 
It seems like Vicky heard that her son was experiencing the desires of a serial killer and did nothing to intervene or get him help. While the incident with the girl in the trailer was five to six years ago, it's likely that Chris's desire to take advantage of a woman never went away. He just learned that it could be hazardous to act on those desires directly, so he adjusted his method. He may have believed that by zoning in on vulnerable girls, he could live out some of his fantasies without as much risk. Okay, that was... I'm trying to remember that, but... Um... It seems unlikely that Chris wouldn't remember what the detectives are talking about, and his acting skills don't appear to be fooling them. Do you understand why? Yeah, I understand it. We as the police department and the people that here work here and now are looking into this uh, young lady who's missing mm -hmm. under, suspicious, yeah, circumstances, under understand. suspicious circumstances in the sense that mm -hmm. she's dropped off the map, not making yeah. phone calls to anybody that she normally talks to almost on a daily basis. Yeah, I understand. We're getting calls and we're getting contact by the family who said you did something to her. I don't know. I don't know you from Adam, but, yeah. but some of these people know you pretty well. To the point that they knew what some of your fantasies were in high school. Honestly, yeah, I never told anyone my fantasies. Not even your mom? No. Did you ever have any discussions with your family about your sexual orientation? No. I... Did they ever confront you about that? Did they ever suspect that maybe you might be gay? Honestly, I'm bisexual, but there's, I mean, they don't need to know that. I and mean, that's what, whatever I do with whoever I do it with is, is my business. Well, okay. that was never an issue with you and your parents or your family? Um, if they have any suspicions about that, they kept it to themselves. Really? Yes. Okay. Chris takes two pretty large drinks of water during this line of questioning. The department and the people that here work here and now are looking into this uh, young lady who's missing. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. This is often considered nonverbal communication indicating nervousness. When a person is anxious, the fight or flight response is triggered, which can cause the throat to become dry. This could explain Chris's desire for water in those moments of high stress when these topics were brought up. Additionally, when some people are nervous, they will drink water or do some other kind of action to diffuse the awkwardness they may feel. The act of grabbing a cup of water in front of them allows them to focus on something else aside from the intense stare of the detective sitting in front of them. Well, Chris, I'm going to ask you right out, flat out, right now. Do you know where Leah is? And did you do something to her? I did nothing to her beyond what I've already said. And honestly, I have no idea where she is. It's important to note that Chris doesn't outright say no when answering this question. This could be an indication of deception, as straight up lying is hard for most people. Instead, by giving a vague, non-committal answer, Chris can still feel like he's partially telling the truth. The detectives will take note of this statement and his lack of actual denial. We also hear him use the word honestly here. Honestly, when you put it that way, honestly, I'm bisexual, but honestly, I never told anyone my fantasies. Something that he said with increasing frequency throughout the interview. His increase in using this convincing statement is telling, as this behavior often shows up more when someone is hiding something and is desperately trying to convince someone that they're telling the truth, rather than actually being honest. Regardless of what Chris is saying to the detectives, they can tell that he's hiding something from them. So is there any reason why we would find Lee's blood in your apartment? Or in your bag? Um, we were starting to get a little more physical. We actually bumped into each other and had a nosebleed, and she had a nosebleed, but other than that, no. Well, what do you mean other than that? Because she had a nosebleed, there's yeah. blood dripping, right? Yeah, it was, um, and we cleaned it up, and it wasn't really anything 
I'm really think much of it at the time. So after she got up, I, you know, cleaned up the little bit of a mess. I mean, it wasn't a major gusher. It was just a couple of drops. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I'm on my uh, pillow. I'm a little concerned that your story about your sheets. Yeah. Chris begins covering his eyes in a movement known as eye blocking. This is a clear indication that he doesn't like where this conversation is going, and there's obviously something about this particular conversation about the sheets that he doesn't want to think about or hear. Uh, where are your sheets? Uh, my pillows are currently on my bed. As far as the sheets, I have no clue. I mean, for the most part, you know, sticking, <laughs> checking stuff in the laundry pile isn't something you really remember all that much. So it was routine, and, and it was covering the duffel bag, so when she grabbed the duffel bag, she might have thought that, that was just hanging out of it, and she'd stuff it in there. Chris uses a selective memory statement, I have no clue, quickly followed by an exclusion qualifier for the most part. He also begins fiddling with his collar and ventilating his shirt. Though this is sometimes seen as a sign of lying, this movement is more clearly an indication of someone's anxiety as they may be growing hot or uncomfortable as their body temperature, sweat, and blood flow increase due to stress. That, combined with him nervously rubbing his neck, constitutes a cluster of deceptive behaviors. He's clearly feeling the stress of the interrogation here. You didn't get rid of the sheets? No. Intentionally get rid of the sheets because maybe there are blood on them? No, sir. If you did, you know, no big deal. Tell us that. You know, if if you did it, yeah, and because you're freaked out, there's blood on there, she's missing, you're thinking, oh, people are going to think the worst. I better get rid of this. I understand that. Yeah. I understand that, okay? But for you to tell me, I don't know what happened to them, that I don't understand. So if that's what I really do not understand. And if I had gotten rid of the sheets, wouldn't I have gotten rid of the pillow too? Why would I keep the pillow, but not the sheets? I don't know. Well, did the pillow have a pillowcase on it? No. Did it? No. The thing's inconsistent, thus, based on the condition of your apartment, that you would be <laughs> all of a sudden, in the middle of that experience, taking your sheets and taking them off the bed. It was afterwards, as I told, as I told them before. Yeah, it was even afterwards. afterwards. Yeah, she came up and used the restroom. The thing's kind of bizarre that, oh, all of a sudden, i got to take the sheets off of my bed? Um, you, you understand? I mean, yeah, let, I, let's face it, your, your apartment's not exactly the tidiest <laughs> okay. I'd be the first to admit that. So, why all of a sudden you're, after you're done having, you've been sleeping on this bed yeah. for hours, would you decide, oh, now is the time that I need to pull these sheets? <sighs> it just doesn't make yeah. sense. Um, honestly, when you put it that way, it doesn't really make much sense to me either. Yeah. But it seemed like the thing to do at the time, because I did laundry the next day, so I didn't want to forget about it. Note how Chris is rubbing his neck, face, and jaw while answering questions. These self-soothing behaviors are all signs of anxiety. As the detective's questions begin ramping up, so do Chris's signs of anxiety. The thing we ask each of them to tell us the truth, no matter what the truth is, mm -hmm. okay? The worst thing you could do is lie to us. Absolutely the worst thing you could do is lie to us, okay? Mm -hmm. so, I understand. So, think about it again. What's the deal with the sheets? Yeah, I did get rid of them. Okay. Yeah. Honestly, I can't think of anything else. Would you be surprised to know that, the sh that her cell phone went out with those sheets? What? Her cell phone? <laughs> her cell phone ended up at the same place the sheets right. did at the dump. I do not know. Honestly, I saw her leave with her cell phone. How do you know she left this phone call? She picked it up. It was sitting by the purse. It was sitting by the purse? Yes. Okay. So from the time she gets this notification, as you refer to it, and the time that she walked out the door, how much time? Well, 
maybe uh, one, two minutes tops. Oh, quick. And now's the time, Chris, that you really need to be honest with us because scientifically and through the pinging of the phone, we can tell where it was taken to. Okay. So was there a problem with the sheets? <sighs> and what else? This is, this is not the time to try to cover your tracks. This is the time for you to be honest with us. <laughs> yeah, I'm just trying to find the, and find the words to say because I mean, to try to find the right words because I know that I have been untruthful, but I, but yes, her phone was with the sheets. Okay. Was she with the phone and the sheets? No. Chris, it's time for you to really be honest with us now because I was a little bit. She was not with the sheets. Is she, is she in line in the dump store? Oh, God, no. You understand what we're asking is, right? Yeah, I understand it, but still, that's... So where is she? Honestly, I do not know. She left and got into the truck. Nobody knew where she was at, Chris. I know that. I mean, We've got her text messages. Yes. We've got her phone records. And we know everybody that she talked to that day. We have phone records, we have cell tower. I thought that it was prearranged, okay? I thought that she had prearranged to have someone pick her up, and then... <sighs> Chris, this is a place where you don't yeah, tell us what happened to Lee. This is your one and probably last opportunity to do this voluntarily. A few minutes earlier, Chris appeared to almost be in the confession body posture, where he was bent forward. However, when the detective pushed him for information, he began to adjust his story again. Perhaps if the detectives had used the tactics of asking him open-ended questions and trying to get him to tell his story without interference, he may have been close to a confession. It's possible that the detective saw Chris was almost in the confession position, and thought if they prodded him, rather than sat back and waited, that they would get the confession. Instead, they pushed a bit too hard, and he shut down. Am I being accused of something? What do you think? It sounds to me like yes. And I maintain my innocence, but I would like a lawyer. Well, by doing that, what you've now done is, is that you've caused us to have to stop our interview with you. Yes, I know. And I will give you a business card, and I'm going to tell you. Not to get out of town? No, I'm going to tell you that if you want to re initiate any conversation with us from here on out, yes. you're the one that's going to have to do that. I understand. With that, Chris is given a business card and is allowed to leave the station. Over the course of the next six days, the detectives continue their investigation into Chris, collecting as much evidence as possible in order to secure an arrest warrant. However, before a warrant could be secured, the police received a shocking 911 call. 911? Uh, yes, I'd like to confess to him, Okay, what happened? The case being handled by detectives, uh, the case being handled by detectives Lopez and, and Lynch. By Detective Lopez and Detective Lynch? Yes. Where are you at? Um, I'm at the park here in Westminster. It's on Cherry Street. I don't know the crossroads, but I, uh, uh, um, You're near the pond? Yes. What is your name? Christopher Wade. Detectives were stunned. Less than a week ago, Chris had been adamantly denying that he had anything to do with Lee's disappearance. And now here he was, confessing to her murder. What had changed? As insinuated by detectives during Chris's first interview, Lee's family were desperate to find out what happened to her. Max, Lee's older brother, knew that Chris was somehow involved in his sister's disappearance, 
and he was tired of waiting for the police to make their arrest, so he took matters into his own hands. In an interview conducted on the same day as Chris's 911 call, Max described how he and Jesse, Lee's ex-boyfriend, worked together to discover the truth. In the last couple days, been, me and Jesse have been playing buddy-buddy with him over text, trying to make him think that we didn't think he did it. Um, we got him to meet up with us to do a tarot card reading for my sister. Mm-hmm. Despite the emotional stress he was under while being near Chris, Max had the smart idea to record every single thing Chris said to him. The confession tapes begin with Chris doing a tarot reading for Lee, claiming that it will give them an idea of her current situation. This isn't the best reading, uh, the best uh, omen for a reading I've done, but it is fairly positive. I don't see any indication of anything who would want any, anything or anyone who would want to harm her or physically impede her in any way. But I do see that when she's coming out of this, she'll be the better for it. I don't know about uh, different, but I think that she will be a changed woman when she comes out of it. I don't, it's the only card that has any bad, uh, I guess you could say bad omen would be the two of swords. The five of wands is a neutral omen but it indicates paranoia, so she might be feeling really scared right now, but the Three of Pentacles and the Lovers are both very positive, as is, the, as is the Six of Pentacles, so I would say there's there's every chance she'll, that when she's found, it'll be safe and sound. It's possible that one of the reasons Chris enjoys doing these tarot readings is because he's able to get people to listen to him and pay attention to him, something he never got in high school and likely hasn't gotten much of as a young adult. It could also give him a sense of power over others, as some people make decisions about their life utilizing these readings, and it's another way to make them do what he wants. Hey, Chris. Mm-hmm. I have one more favor to ask of you. Okay. <clears throat> Not as a suspect and family sitting here, Mm -hmm. but as friends and acquaintances and a group of people that used to know each other and all um, are worried about this girl that's missing. Yeah. Instead of me and Max, you know, maybe badgering you with questions, Mm -hmm. would you just tell all of us as friends, like once and for good, like just what happened that day while she was there, when she got to your house and just what took place. Okay. For for our peace of mind. All right. I'm confused why you told me you can't talk about all this. Um, and you're talking about all this. I mean, it's good that yeah, you are. It's good that you are. But they would tell me not to talk to you. They wouldn't tell you not to talk to me. Yeah, I yeah. Mean, no. It's hard to explain the uh, things that go on in my head sometimes to someone else, but... Chris, your stories, they didn't add up at all. Not one. You told different things to other people. If you had something not to hide, you would have told the truth the whole time. You're up. Why did you keep things back the first, Why did the first time you told this story? I will be going forward with the police about this. I haven't yet because I'm trying to find the right way to do it. So This I'm, is the right way, right? Yeah. Now. This, this is, is it. Right this way. is it. I know. But what I say right now, it's going to be very hard. But until I come forward with them to it, it'll be within the week, I swear to you. But I'm gonna ask. I'm gonna have to ask you to keep it to yourselves until then. You tell me right now what happened to my sister. You know what happened to my sister. Yes. You know if she's alive or if she's dead. You know. I do. Unlike in my original story, afterwards she wasn't tired and didn't ask to pass out. She 
tried to use that to manipulate. She didn't, she wasn't yelling, but she was very venomous. <laughs> and she grabbed the knife that I keep by my, <laughs> by my bed. And when we go back, I can show it to you. What she, happened with the knife? She grabbed it and pulled it out and tried to attack me. Saying that she would stop attacking me if I agreed to buy drugs for her. She, I don't know, but she was, there was desperation in her eyes. She wouldn't I, do that, dude. She wouldn't do well, that, Chris. Stop lying. She wouldn't I'm not do that. lying. She wouldn't do that. Keep going. Keep going. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm just over. I am not lying. Okay. She thrust at me twice. I dodged the first one, then I grabbed her hand on the second. And when she thrust again, I turned, grabbed her, and stepped forward and twisted her around so that her body was in between me and the knife. And then I placed my hand at her throat. I didn't start squeezing until after she kept going. I said, I can, we can end this right now. There will be no, uh, I won't say anything to anyone. Just please drop the knife. And I'll let and I'll let you go. You can get dressed. You can leave and go wherever. And she said that she would stop when I uh, when either she was dead or if I agreed to buy her drugs. I told her I did not want that. I told her straight up to please stop and get dressed and go. But she used both of her arms to push against me with the knife, trying to cut my arm to get me to let go so she could keep attacking. So I started squeezing on her throat. There's no way Chris could have positively known Lee's intent in that moment. It's also worth noting that Lee was only 90 pounds, making it hard to believe that Chris was struggling to overpower her and get the knife. This is what makes his story sound just like that, a story. He's decided that the only way out of this is to claim that anything that happened to Lee was in self-defense. Honestly, she, um, I thought that her muscles would relax when she went unconscious and that I could gradually move the knife away and let her go and let her regain consciousness. But that didn't happen. I'm, I've been running through my head trying to figure out why. She kept on fighting and fighting. I kept on telling her to drop the knife and I would stop. Drop the knife and I'll stop. You can, and I will leave the room. I'll be waiting out in the patio. You can get dressed, you can go. I won't, I, I'll stop talking to you completely. But she kept shaking her head, no. Adrenaline was rushing through. I didn't, I didn't see her stop shaking her head, but she was still, she was still pushing against my hand. So, but, then it was like a rubber band snapped and she just, it just went completely lax. And I, it took me, it took me completely by surprise and I ended up cutting her. It was, it wasn't very deep. It was about an inch or inch and a half cut along her sternum. That took me completely by surprise and I dropped her. I, she landed on the floor. I turned her over to check and make sure she was still alive. I didn't check with on her throat because I had just been grabbing there, so I didn't I didn't think I could get a clear reading off of that. So I checked her wrists and when that didn't when I didn't find anything there, I checked under her arms and then the inside of her legs as well. And I keep going back and thinking I could have handled that better, but I just panicked. Although many had suspected it already, this was the first time Lee's death had been confirmed. After she went limp and I checked the pulse and didn't find anything. So you couldn't call the cops though? You didn't? You didn't Honestly, I was... Like, bring her back or did she... Well, hold on. Yeah, what happened after she went limp? After she went limp and I checked the pulse and didn't find anything, I... I'll admit it, I was, I flat out panicked. After I was, 
coherent enough to start functioning uh, functioning again, I, I'll admit it, I wasn't rational, and I did things that I should not have. I should not have done it, but I covered everything up. Just like we saw with his initial interview, Chris is back to using convincing statements. We can hear him using statements like honestly and God's honest truth in order to try and manipulate everyone into believing him. It's possible that one of the motivations behind this confession is that it's possible he knew the police were on to him and it was only a matter of time before they arrested him. He may have wanted to test out his self-defense story on Lee's loved ones to see if they believed him. If they weren't buying it, he would then have some time to adjust his story to make it more believable for police. Chris likely had no idea that he was already being recorded. I took her body and I put her clothes back on. Then I laid her on my bed and covered her in a blanket while I was trying to figure out what what to do. I I didn't wrap her in them or anything like that. I put a bag over her head just to just because even though I kept whispering to her, I'm sorry it came to this late. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was sobbing it to her while I was doing this. I felt really, I felt guilty over what, what had happened. After I got rid of her, I didn't want the smell to attract anyone. And they were odor, those odor control trash bags. So I figured I'd lay a couple of, over her. I put a bag over her head, and then I placed two on top of her. Concealing the victim's face is often done for a few different reasons, but in this case, the only likely reason is due to emotional detachment. Some killers cover their victim's face as a means of distancing themselves emotionally from them. By concealing the face, they might create a psychological barrier to dissociate themselves from the person they have harmed, making it easier to commit the act. Due to Chris's pedantic speech, it's hard to tell if he's being honest. He sounds very dramatic at times, such as when he's talking about sobbing to Lee's corpse, as if he's trying to convince the others that killing Lee and hiding her body pained him. The emotion he's trying to portray doesn't match up with the horrifying story he's telling. It's also worth noting that Chris was incredibly meticulous in terms of the steps he took to hide the body, such as using odor control garbage bags. It's almost as if he had planned this in his mind and in his fantasies for a long time. Afterwards, my roommate walked in. He was, he was early, and I just told him that I had a guest over and that she was sleeping. I took, before he had got home, I had used some rags to clean up the blood and I put those into a grocery bag, and I put that into the into the duffel bag with her. I carried it out. I and at first I tried the waiting game. When two o'clock in the morning rolled around, and he hadn't gone to sleep, I decided to try and sneak it past him. I was taking it out. I don't think he would have noticed if I hadn't said anything, but. If, in case he did notice, I just said I was taking something to my car. But I didn't take her to my car. I I knew that if I was gone for any length of time, he'd get suspicious. So I did the only thing I could think of. And God help me, I put her in the dumpster. It's important to note how Chris repeatedly refers to Lee's body as it. Referring to her as it may allow Chris to forget that this is a human body of a girl he has known since high school, thus letting him distance himself from his own terrifying acts. I know you won't believe me, but I will be turning myself into the police. I will tell them... No, you're going to jail right now. You're going to prison right now. Where do you think you're going, man? You think I'm just going to let you walk away and drive away? You killed my goddamn sister. All this recorded, call the cops. They're already on their way. 
Having finally heard enough, Max did what likely everyone in his shoes would want to do. He punched Chris. Chris was forced to call 911 shortly after that, and the police soon arrived to arrest him. Max was also brought down to the station in order to give a statement to police. He said that she tried to attack him for drug money right. when I was going to give her money, and she knew it. So why would she go that far? She would just be like, my brother's going to give me money off and leave. Max certainly brings up a good point. It makes no sense for a 90-pound woman to start a fight with a man who is nearly six foot three when she knew she would be able to buy substances as soon as she met up with her brother. Uh, the first time I talked to him, he told me Sunday, the, right? the basic things. She came over, they talked, He, she fell asleep, he looked through her purse, found paraphernalia, not heroin itself, that's a lie. She, There was no actual heroin in her purse, mm-hmm. like... At least I don't think so, and I really doubt it, because if she had it, she would be trying to kill him for drug money, which that's another inconsistency in his life. She had heroin on her. Again, Max's logic checks out, and it makes sense that he immediately suspected Chris was somehow involved. Aside from pointing out the issues with Chris's story, Max also points out inconsistencies with Chris's character. During his initial interview, Chris made sure to emphasize how much he loved his friends and how he would be willing to sacrifice anything for them. However, Max's interactions with Chris show a different side of him. The one thing that specifically pissed me off is because he he messaged me and he was upset that Mm -hmm. the media went to his house. He was upset at me and my mom because we told the media the apartment number, which I don't remember us even saying that. So I told him, I was like, I'm really, really sorry. Like, my mom must have said something. She's just worried sick about her daughter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, like, come on, man. And he's just like, and he says, well, tell your mom, thank you for all the migraines she's given me. And I want, and I hope she gets a, I hope she gets a migraine herself for all the pain she has caused me. Despite Chris claiming that he would do anything for those he cares about, he reveals his profound selfishness when he wishes a migraine on Lee's mother. People with antisocial personality disorder seem to completely delete from their awareness how they contributed to or caused a problem. They only see how other people's actions affect them. Chris's insistence that he is a gentleman despite clearly not acting like one could also be an indicator that he has significant grandiosity and narcissism, something that is very typical of people with antisocial personality disorder. It's possible that Chris believed himself to be superior to other guys, i.e. the bad ones who mistreated girls like Lee and his own pregnant girlfriend. This is, of course, a paradox because Chris had long developed desires to kidnap, assault, and murder. I used to go to high school with him. Oh, okay. Cotopaxi. You know where Cotopaxi So how long have you this known This is in Canyon him? City in the mountains. Oh, oh all knew I've other. heard of that, yeah. Okay. This is how she knew him. I mean... Were you... How, how old are you? I'm 21. And he was... I don't know, like 22. So he's a little... He was like... He's he one grade up. About this is like a small word, like mm-hmm. K through 12, exactly, basically. Yeah. So how many years did you know him total? He was only an acquaintance to me. I oh, never okay. really... Hung out. Hung out with him. But ever. it was a small enough school, though, where you did. Yeah, this is like, not once did I ever, like, give him or anything like that. I wasn't that kind of kid in high school. It was just like, I talked to him sometimes, but I never, like, was, like, really buddy-buddy with him, you know? Like, he's an acquaintance. He's someone I knew at school, you know? I didn't really... He was creepy to me. In high school? He just looked like he was creepy. And, I, you know, that was it for me right there. I talked to his mom, like, two days ago, and... Because I heard that he had thoughts of killing a certain girl while he was in high school. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to confirm it. All these plans to assault girls demonstrates that Chris was a ticking time bomb. Sadly, his verbalized desires were not taken seriously. Typically, when a person has such morbid thoughts, it's likely not long until they act on them. Oftentimes, they just need to be presented with an opportunity a situation where they feel they can get away with it. Uh, you described Chris as being creepy in high school and weird. Can you describe, you know, the, the creepiness, you know, what, you know, things that he did that, that would uh, cause people to characterize him as being creepy would, and weird? You know, I seen him in high school and, like, you know, he looked frustrated with 
himself all the time. And uh, he also, you know, just the way, you know, you could just see somebody and just like know that you know, they're just weird, you know. And um, not even, it's not even like with drugs or anything, like he's just really weird. I know that he thought he was, he had a mental disability. I don't know exactly what it was, but you can kind of tell when you see him. And his mom even said that he did. Um, he actually would think, and his mom told me this, to, and it remind, and it totally brought back my memory of like when I did go to high school and what I did hear about him. And then he was, he would get frustrated with girls because in his head they would be flirting with him. And I talked to everybody I went to school with, not once, you know, nobody, nobody flirted with him, not one person. And uh, he would take, he would think that someone's flirting with him, and he would get really upset and frustrated. Mood was cha would change all the time in high school. Like one day he's like talkative a little bit, one day he's just silent. This could be an indicator that Chris may have struggled with social cues. It's also possible that he was showing signs of grandiosity beginning in high school, and he wanted to believe that girls found him desirable, only to become frustrated and angry when that didn't turn out to be the case. This may have contributed to Chris gradually developing anger towards girls, which ultimately accumulated and led to him wanting to seek revenge against women in general for not acknowledging him. With the insightful information they'd gathered from Max, and now that Chris had confessed, it was time for detectives to once again question him and get to the bottom of what actually happened to Lee. Only this time, he has his attorney with him. Much like his confession in the park, Chris's story starts out similar to his original story. Lee came over to hang out, the two got food, played some video games, and then Lee kissed him, leading to the two sleeping together. Then afterwards, she wasn't tired, but she did uh, try to sweet talk me into buying drugs for her. She, and when I told her that no, I wouldn't buy her drugs, she escalated from there, trying just regular persuasion, then coercion. She wasn't yelling, but she was very acidic. In her words, Chris's nonverbal communication is locked down tight. His hands are tightly clasped, and while it's hard to be certain based on the angle, it looks like his ankles are tightly locked underneath him. This indicates a high level of defensiveness and anxiety. He's not open to the officers at all, or even his attorney. And I tried to explain to her that the, the, this was an unplanned thing that was her from the start. I had no other feelings for her beyond that of a friend. And she grabbed the knife that I keep by my bed. Grabbed the knife? Yeah. From where? It was between my bed and the wall. She grabbed the knife and pulled it out. And she started threatening me with it. Immediately, there are some issues with Chris's story. First of all, he claims that he has no feelings for Lee other than friendship. However, according to his Facebook DMs with Lee, that's not quite true. When Lee was briefly considering moving in with Chris in order to stay off the streets, he told her she could sleep in his bed and that he wouldn't mind having a relationship with her. Lee made it clear that she wasn't interested in Chris, calling into question whether or not she would have actually slept with him, or if this is just another thing Chris is lying about. Additionally, Chris claims that Lee grabbed the duct tape knife he kept between the wall and his bed. Considering that this was the very first time Lee had ever been in Chris's room, so it's hard to believe that she would know that the duct tape object poking out from between the mattress and the wall was a knife. Then she started, and I started thrusting it at me. It was overhand, straightforward, and I told I kept a firm, but not too firm grip on her hand. We please stop and I'll let you go. You can, uh, you won't hear anything about this from me to the uh, police report or anything like that. You can grab your, uh, you can get dressed, you can grab your stuff, you can go right now, I won't stop you. And she said, no, it was not gonna work out like that. That's exactly what she said? Um, well, she said, no, if I can't have drugs, then I want to die. It's interesting to note that Chris telling Lee he would let her go free and never speak with her again 
sounds more like something you would say to someone you had just attacked, as opposed to something you would say to someone who was attacking you. His hand covering his chest is a protective gesture, which would make sense as he's talking about allegedly being attacked. However, the collarbone is a sensitive area of the body, and covering it could be a subconscious, self-comforting gesture. It may indicate that he's feeling vulnerable or emotionally guarded during this conversation. It could also be an attempt to create a barrier between himself and the detectives, signaling a desire to protect himself because he might not be telling the truth. I guess I was, wasn't paying attention after a while because the adrenaline was getting to me or something. I didn't notice her stop shaking her head, but she was still. I did notice that she was still struggling against my hand. But then after that, I I let go and I brought her to the floor. I laid her, I laid her back down to the floor and I panicked. I, at this point, do you wish to continue to speak? Um, it's... As Chris continues his story, notice how his feet and body are angled away from everyone else at the table. This posture is commonly known as a closed nonverbal cue and could be an indication of discomfort and disinterest, as facing towards someone else when speaking to them is a sign of being engaged in the conversation. People's feet often point in the direction that they want to go. His feet are aimed away from the room, showing that he wants to leave. People can much more easily lie with their hands and mouths than they can with their feet, because we aren't taught to watch our feet when we lie. Now having heard Chris's story about the fight, the detectives begin to pick away at his questionable story. Did you have to after she was dead? No. Do. That's... That's not even... In, anything out of my fantasies, even. I mean, my fantasies from high school had gone pretty dark, and that's, that wasn't even in there. So you say that's not part of your fantasies. What are your fantasies? I'm going to say, to, again, counsel you not to answer the question. Chris acts very oddly when asked this question. Where most people would vehemently deny such a disgusting accusation, Chris gives an emotionless, no, you. As he says this, you can actually see him shake his head up and down, almost like he was shaking his head yes, while verbally replying no. Once again indicating that while Chris may be telling the police one answer, he's clearly thinking about another. With Chris bringing up his dark high school fantasies, detectives try to dig a little deeper into his innermost thoughts. When we talked to you the other night, you told us about a couple of girls in high school that you were still angry at. I'm not angry at them now, but I was very angry at them uh, in the past, and when I was in high school. I mean, I knew they were, they were just being kids now, but back then I was very, very angry at them, and I wrote down the things I would like to do to them in the journal. Um, and where's that journal at? The one that you wrote down all that stuff in? Is that something you kept? No, I didn't keep it. This might seem a little bit bizarre to you, but are you under any kind of a treatment for mental health issues right now? No. Have you ever been? I have. It was because I was having nightmares in the Army. And the doctors there were more concerned about uh, getting me a full night's sleep and making sure that I was fit for duty than they were about uh, my mental health. It's important to understand that any medical discharge for psychiatric reasons would have most likely involved a serious mental health diagnosis, which effectively rendered Chris unfit for future military service. Do you hear voices? No, but the main... Um, factor in me deciding to come forward with the truth is somewhat bizarre. I'm going to ask you yeah. again to okay. not reveal any further details. It's important to note that an attorney cannot forbid a client from speaking with law enforcement. Even if they advise against it, the client is in control of the representation and the attorney has to respect those wishes. Though it's not clear if Chris's attorney advised him to talk to police, 
It's pretty likely that the attorney told him not to, but Chris decided against this. I guess what I'm trying to get at is just as if you got yeah. any mental health issues that we need to be aware of. Okay. Are you, no. Have you thought of yourself at all before this thing? Oh, this thing, um, I thought, I thought about it briefly, and I thought about it briefly, but my point of view is that the the mental health issues that I'm having right now are probably just the the easiest course of action is very rarely the right course of action. Have you ever been diagnosed with any mental condition? And then I'm going to ask you to not respond. Not to my knowledge, no. Are you aware of, your, of reality? Yes. Do you know where you are right now? I'm in the Westminster Police Department in an interrogation room. Chris's lawyer may have advised him not to answer this because it's possible that they are considering a diminished capacity or insanity defense. A key aspect of that type of defense is that the defendant didn't know the crime was wrong or didn't understand. Admitting to a known diagnosis suggests prior knowledge of the mental disease or defect and therefore also its impact on the defendant prior to the crime. Admitting that he knew he had a diagnosis could eviscerate the chance of them using this defense. Despite his lawyer's warnings, Chris did eventually decide to come forward with this information. If you remember, Chris had told Max that he was already planning on turning himself in the week that Max got him to confess. Chris claimed that his tarot cards told him that if he didn't confess, the guilt would eventually destroy him, and he alleged that he was going to take his own life. But Lee's spirit had come to him and told him not to. I, I'm not going to judge it right or wrong, but I do regret what I did. And I keep wishing that I could go back and do it over again to try and keep that from happening. Do you think you should be punished? I'm going to ask you not to answer the question. Yes and no. Yes, because I, in my panic, I lied and I destroyed evidence, but now I'm out for her murder. And I'll accept punishment for her death, but not for her murder. This is a very classic response by individuals with antisocial personality disorder. They often manage to twist stories around to place the victim at fault. As detectives prepare to wrap up Chris's confession, he tells them there's something important he needs to share with them. When I came in here just a second ago, you said that there were some things you wanted to yeah. add to this. Now, before I forget that, and before yeah. we not give you that opportunity, I just want to give you the opportunity to add whatever you want to. Um, it's just that um, overall, I live my life as not really emotionless as possible, but not very touchy-feely either. Um, it's not that I don't feel emotion, but I keep a very tight ring on it. And at my grandmother's funeral, I probably cried maybe four or five tears total. And even with all the touchy-feely speeches and stuff at my brother's wedding, I was having him shed a tear. So just um, to notify you of that, that I'm, I have emotion, but I but I keep a tight chain on it. Because about the only emotion that I find any sort of value in is loyalty to friends, to family, stuff like that. Even after confessing to murdering someone and covering it up, Chris is still doing his nice guy routine, claiming that above all, he values loyalty. With this final statement from Chris, his interrogation was concluded and he was arrested and charged with Lee's murder. One of his criminology professors would soon come forward and state that he believed the criminal justice classes he took helped Chris learn how to manipulate a crime scene. In fact, as police continued to gather evidence, they spotted Chris on security footage at a 7-Eleven near his apartment, where he bought bleach and rubber gloves on June 4th, the day after Lee was killed, which he then used to clean up after her death. Though Chris later denied that he went into criminology to learn how to commit murder, he admitted that his classes helped him to predict the line of questioning in the interrogation room. And yet, it didn't help him. After his arrest, Chris made a few video calls to his friends and family, and they were interesting, to say the least. While talking to his mother, 
he alluded to the fact that he never expected to be in jail, perhaps because he didn't think he would be caught. And they're getting ready to discharge me from medical into general population. They're all sitting there, oh, they're just sitting there saying, okay, you know, we're going to send you to medium. You should be safe there. You, all you have to do is just tell them, if they ask you what you're in for, just tell them, you know, domestic violence or something like that. And I just sat there and I'm like, uh, you do know my case is all over the news right now, right? Then he's like, okay, hold on a minute. Let's see what we can do about that. Then next thing you know, they came, <laughs> they came in and checked me some uh, fatigues for the minimum security. Oh. <laughs> Did they think there would be some violence in the other one? Uh they didn't say it, but I would assume yes. How do you feel about that? Mm. It would be nice if people didn't jump to conclusions, but it's understandable. It's, it's hard, not, <laughs> hard to, to follow what the lawyers were saying and not talk about everything, because like everybody in here is talking about what they've done and uh, I think it just feels impolite not to talk about it, but I just tell them it's still a kind of a sore subject. You said that it would be sometime in September when the DA presents the case. Okay. Uh, well, that'll be interesting. Yeah. Hmm. So I've been uh, trying to keep myself busy playing chess and checkers and relearning the game of Uno and Skipbo. On a few occasions, some of Chris's classmates video called him to offer their support. But all of our friends are behind you and we believe that we love you and we wanted you to know that no matter what, you're still going to be here. We're still here for you and I want you to feel alone, bro. Not going to lie, dude. Like, we seriously have been really, like, pissed off because a lot of people had to stay on your Facebook. So we definitely got on there and the ground having your back about that. That's certainly pretty hard work, yeah. Yeah. How does one talk about situations like this? I can just imagine how you feel, dude. Like, I don't know. What's going through your head? Are you scared? <laughs> uh, I'm not scared, but not bored. Good. I'm glad that you're not like completely by yourself in there, and that people aren't trying to keep his. Then I would have to like break in there, so <laughs> and defend you. In another call, his classmate again emphasizes her support of him. I think about you a lot, like more than you know, probably more than I should. Like, and I realized how much you meant to me until you weren't there anymore. And I feel like every, I don't know, I feel like it's a lot of people. But I don't want you to think that you are forgotten about or that you're not loved. But I was already insane to begin with, so that didn't really help or hurt for me. His classmates ended one of their calls by offering Chris some advice, but only time would tell if he would actually take it. Do you not know what the Fifth Amendment is? Yeah, we need to have a lesson here. Do I need to walk you through this? You have the right. Uh, <laughs> anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. So shut up. Even if it's you and I know you. I know how smart you are and I know how sarcastic you are. And I know when somebody pisses you off, you get smart and sarcastic without even thinking twice about it. And shit like that can get you in trouble. So watch your. Really? The question was, would those who knew Chris still support him after police uncovered his truly deplorable secrets? While it seemed to many that this disturbing case was finally at an end, Chris still had several more disturbing secrets for the police to uncover. Ones that were so twisted, no one had yet suspected the true depths of his depravity. During their thorough search of Chris's apartment, they discovered a spiral notebook where Chris had written down his confession. The notebook told the same story that had already been told to police. However, some of Chris's deeper thoughts about the event were revealed. 
Maybe the inspiration behind his decision to document his demented version of Lee's death in writing was derived from one of his many past tarot readings. One particular card, Judgment Reversed, may have struck a powerful chord within him. A note written by Chris read as follows. This card represents me. I believe that the deck is warning me of a character flaw within myself, that I am gathering bad karma, or it could mean I'm avoiding a decision for fear of the what-ifs. Apparently, he faced his fear and composed the letter, an excerpt from his chilling confession read as follows. Before I begin, let me again offer my most sincere apologies, both for the pain I've caused because of my fear, as well as the pain I'm about to bring by stepping forward with the truth. Lee is dead. Later in the letter, he wrote, I lied to try to protect myself out of fear, fear that no one would believe the truth. Chris was right to feel fearful. However, nothing about his far-fetched story so much as resembled truth. Chris makes himself out to be the victim in these pages, pondering about what Lee would say to him if he confronted her for manipulating him. He also claims that Lee used him as the weapon of choice to take her own life, showing just how unwilling Chris is to take responsibility for his horrid actions against her. Alongside the notebook, police discovered something they never would have expected. Chris appeared to have several pairs of underwear which looked like they belonged to a girl much younger than him. Over the course of the search, the police learned that Chris was an avid writer. Whether he was writing down the results of his tarot readings, working on the manuscript for a novel, or just jotting down random thoughts, it seemed like they were always finding a notebook or a piece of paper with some writing on it. These writings all appeared to be harmless at first. However, closer inspection of one of the stories they had found proved to be more than concerning. Titled Uncle Dave, the story was written by Chris and appeared to be about a 32-year-old uncle abusing his prepubescent niece. To say the officers who discovered this were disturbed would be an understatement. Between this perverse story and the underwear that had been previously found, officers were becoming increasingly worried about how far Chris's depravity might go. As with Lee and many others his age, Chris would spend much of his time talking to friends on sites like Facebook, Wondering if there could be evidence hidden away in Chris and Lee's Facebook DMs, officers took Chris's computer and did a deep dive into his account. While the conversation between him and Lee would prove useful to the case, it was the other conversations on the account that really put detectives on edge. Based on the messages they were able to find, Chris seemed to have several women in online contractual slave relationships. He would find women, often from foreign countries, who were in desperate need of money. He would promise them money in exchange for explicit photos, conversations, and complete control over their lives. For one particular woman, Chris even made her agree to let him kill her whenever he wanted, claiming that it would be legal as long as she signed a contract, stating that she was giving him permission to murder her. A message from Chris to the woman read as follows. If I have a legal document drawn up stating that she became my slave of her own free will, I believe that would mitigate things severely. For this particular woman, Chris's message served as a reminder to refer to him as sir at all times. Oftentimes in the messages, the women would show reluctance towards some of the things Chris would ask of them, and he would manipulate them into eventually giving him what he wanted. Having promised money to several different women in exchange for these relationships, Chris often found himself short on funds for the month and would not give the women their money even when they did follow his orders. This entire situation is indicative of Chris's sadism as he seems to enjoy the power and control aspect of committing violence against vulnerable women. The police were horrified to discover the relationships Chris had with these women and it was clear he was just taking advantage of vulnerable women who were willing to do anything to get money for their families. The more they uncovered about Chris's personal life, the more and more his claim that he killed Lee in self-defense began to fall apart. Unfortunately, things were only going to get worse from here. Continuing their search of his computer, the detective's worst fear was discovered. Chris had been looking at explicit photos of children. Through his browser history, they'd been able to prove that he had been on several sites that hosted these disgusting photos. 
When paired with everything else they had discovered about Chris, detectives were able to put together a complete picture of this depraved individual. Chris preyed on vulnerability, which is why he sought out Lee with her addiction problems, women online with financial issues, a girlfriend who had become pregnant and was abandoned, and, most disturbingly of all, defenseless, powerless children. Unfortunately, despite the information given by Chris, Lee's body has never been found, though some of her clothing and her bag were eventually found in the local dump. Chris was eventually charged with first-degree murder, assault, evidence tampering, and the possession of inappropriate photos of minors. Realizing that he was looking at spending the rest of his life in prison, Chris supposedly cut a deal with prosecutors to plead guilty to second-degree murder and exploitation of a child in exchange for having the rest of his charges dropped. With this deal in place, Chris was sentenced to 48 years in prison.